With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. One of my favorite stories to tell, and I've shared it with you before, is of the young preacher who graduated from seminary and took his very first church. On his first Sunday, he was nervous and he got up to preach, didn't know what to preach about, so he decided he would preach about the stuff he'd heard preached about when he was growing up as a boy. And so he preached against the evils of drinking beveraged alcohol, taking for his text Proverbs 20, verse 1, that, by the way, still says that wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. After the service, there was a deacon waiting on him in the lobby, preacher. You don't have any way to know this, being new to town, but this is Anheuser-Busch country. In fact, the local distributorship is one of the largest employers in the county. If I were you, I wouldn't preach anymore against drinking alcohol. So he got up his second Sunday and preached against the evils of cigarette smoking, taking for his text 1 Corinthians 6, where the Bible says you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body. And that same deacon was waiting on him in the lobby. Preacher, you wouldn't have any way to know this, but this is, this is also long-leaf tobacco country, while the church budget is largely supported by the sale of tobacco at the local auction house. If I were you, I wouldn't preach anymore against smoking. And so the young preacher got up the third Sunday, didn't know what to preach about, so he preached against the evil of playing the Georgia lottery. Somebody say amen right there. He took for his text, 1 Timothy chapter 6, where the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and many, by pursuing it, have pierced themselves through with many a worthless scratch-off ticket. That's the Mike Stone translation. Many have pierced themselves through with many a grief. And wouldn't you know it, that deacon was waiting in the lobby. Preacher, you don't know this, but there's a Greyhound dog track right across the state line, and why most of your Christmas bonus is going to come from money that the deacons make betting on the dogs on Friday and Saturday nights. I, I wouldn't preach anymore against gambling. And so the young preacher got up a bit confused on his fourth Sunday. He said, I preached against everything I know to preach against, but I hear that y'all are doing all this stuff. I preached against drinking, smoking, and gambling. And that's when the church treasurer jumped to his feet and said, preach against tithing, brother. Ain't many of them doing that. (laughs) Well, the last sermon that I preached on money was in October of 2021. When our monthly memory verse was 2 Corinthians 9, 7. And you probably don't remember, but that sermon was not even about the offering. It was about cultivating a heart of generosity for ourselves and for our children. Before that, the last sermon I preached was two and a half years before that. When preaching through 1 Corinthians verse by verse, we came to this very text. I say that in part to say to our guests, we don't talk about money very often. And if you are a backslidden member who says, every time I go to church, he preaches about money, you really ought to think about coming a little bit more often. In fact, if I preach about money every time you come, let me go ahead and say Happy Thanksgiving. (laughs) Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Valentine's Day. Wear green on St. Patrick's Day or you're going to get pinched. Watch out for those practical jokes on April Fool's. I hope that you have a great summer vacation. Be safe on Labor Day at the lake as well, and we'll see you about this time next year. The truth is, we don't talk about money probably as often as we should. For Jesus spoke about money more than any other subject. And it just so happens, counting today, I'm going to be talking about money the next three Sundays. Now, I don't normally like to talk about money that much, that close together, but last Sunday night in church conference, you voted to build about a $2 million children's building. You voted to authorize our church trustees to take a line of credit, and you also instructed me to preach three Sundays on giving. Now, I don't want to do it, but I'm a man under authority. And so today and for the next two weeks, we're going to talk about Christian stewardship. But don't book your Airbnb to be out of town because I believe the Lord's laid some messages on my heart that will have you thrilled and excited about the opportunity to invest in the work of Jesus in the earth today. Now, as I mentioned, last Sunday evening, we voted on a 
roughly $2 million project, and roughly half of that money is already on hand. The other half is in hand, but it's in your hand. And I want to talk to you about the importance of putting all of it in God's hands. I did not say to put all of it in the offering box. I said to put all of it in God's hands. You see, one reason that I don't preach percentage giving is because a lot of people think, well, that's the percentage I give God and I can do whatever I want to with the rest. Listen very carefully. The first thing you need to know about your money, biblically speaking, is that your money is not your money. All of it belongs to God. Every last penny belongs to the Lord. Because when He bought you at the cross, He bought everything that you would ever have. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Jesus owns you, child of God, lock, stock, and barrel, and therefore He owns everything that we have. We rejoiced when we sang and testified about God holding our soul in His hand. Friend, if I can trust Him with my eternal destiny, I can trust Him with my wallet. God has a plan for the offering. And under divine inspiration, the Apostle Paul lays out that plan for the church at Corinth and the church at Emmanuel. And I want to show, show it to you in three simple ways. First, it begins with a spiritual attitude. A spiritual attitude. Please understand that God is exponentially more concerned about the heart than the pocketbook. In fact, Isaiah rebuke the people of his day, and Jesus would later quote that rebuke, rebuking the people of his day, and say, you worship me with your lip, but your heart is far from me. He might say, you worship me with the offering box, but your heart is far from me. And while the church would take the offering, God is not pleased with a hand that does right attached to a heart that's doing wrong. In his classic novel, A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens describes Ebenezer Scrooge and says he was a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. No warmth could warm him. No wintry weather could chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. And God does not want that kind of attitude from His people. In fact, I believe one of the hallmark passages for New Testament giving is found in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. We learned this a couple of years ago as a memory verse. There the Bible says, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a what? cheerful giver. Some preachers say you need to give until it hurts. I say, no, don't stop there. Give till it feels good. For God loves a cheerful giver. Some preach grudge giving that says, I have to. Some preach guilt giving that says, I ought to. I want to preach about grace giving that says, I get to. Giving that has a spiritual attitude. And based on the context of this month's memory verse, I think there are three reasons that we ought to have a God-honoring attitude. Number one, the resurrection of our Savior. The resurrection of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When you look in chapter 16, verse 1, Paul says, Now concerning the collection for the saints. You may remember in our study of 1 Corinthians, it's obvious that Paul writes this letter to answer questions that they had sent to him. And when he's specifically addressing their questions, he uses phrases like, now concerning the thing about which you wrote, now concerning this, or now addressing that. So it's obvious the Corinthian believers had sent Paul a question about a collection 
for the beleaguered saints at Jerusalem. It was a special love offering that we'll talk about more in just a moment. But Paul doesn't begin this letter by talking about money. It's worth noting that he puts it at the end of the book, in the last chapter. It seems he needed to tell them some other things first so they'd have the right attitude about instructions for the collection plate. Specifically, it falls on the heels of the 15th chapter, that great pinnacle of faith about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Back in chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, he says that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And Paul goes on to describe all the terrible things that would be true if Jesus Christ had not been raised from the dead. Our preaching would be in vain. Our faith would be in vain. Our witness would be a false witness. And we should be above all men pitied. But hallelujah, Christ Jesus has been raised from the dead. And he is the first fruits of all who would be raised from the dead. So much so that because of what Jesus accomplished in his resurrection, one day every dead Christian will be resurrected bodily from the grave. And we who are alive at that time will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And when that corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and the mortal shall have put on immortality, when the perishable shall be raised imperishable. Hey, you're going to join me in leaving this sin-cursed world, saying, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, now that you understand what Jesus has done for you, you'll have the right attitude to receive some instruction about the offering. By the way, Jesus taught that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. You can't tell where a person's heart is by listening to everything they say. They'll lie to you. You can't even tell where a person's heart is by watching everywhere they go. They may be a fake, a fraud, and a phony, but Jesus said if you want to know where your heart is, check out where your treasure is being held. And Paul says, now that you understand the resurrection of our Savior, you can have the right attitude about the collection. We're motivated by the resurrection of our Savior, but also in this passage by the reward for our service. At the very end of chapter 15, Paul said, therefore, I'm in verse 58, in light of the resurrection, therefore, my beloved brethren, by the way, this passage And this sermon is directed to the brethren. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you ought not enjoy a a sermon on the offering plate. But now if you're born again, you ought to enjoy anything that's a faithful declaration of God's Word. And in 1558, Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He said, what you do for the cause of Christ matters. Now, he had already taught them back in chapter 3 about what we call the judgment seat of Christ. Bible students may call it the Bema seat judgment. There we learn that the, the work of our life will be tried and tested by fire to see if it's gold, silver, and precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble. Now, look right here and listen carefully. Most of the time when preachers preach about gold, silver, precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble, they describe the wood, hay, and stubble as being sinful stuff. Wood, hay, and stubble is not sinful. It just won't stand in the fire. It doesn't have to be evil to be worthless in light of eternity. And Paul said, if, you, if you're really going to understand the offering and have the right attitude about it, You need to know that Jesus died, rose again, and one day, even after you've died, you're going to rise again as well, and you're going to stand before God and give an account for what you did with that which the Lord gave to you. Jesus affirms this truth, of course, in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and following, the Lord said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth 
where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I love the humorous story of the man who died and went to heaven. St. Peter was walking him down the streets of gold. They passed this huge mansion. The man said, who lives there? He said, oh, that's where Billy Graham lives. They went a little further, passed another huge mansion. Who lives there? He said, that's where the apostle Paul lives. And then they came up on a beat-up, run-down, tiny little shack. And St. Peter said, this is where you are going to live. He said, why do I get a little shack? Peter said, that's all we could build with the money you sent ahead. (laughs) And the Bible teaches us that we can't take it with us, but we can send it on ahead and lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. This week I came across a fascinating story. In fact, so fascinating, it was on a Twitter feed called Fascinating. It's the story of an OBGYN, Dr. Michael Shannon, who in 1981 worked feverishly, miraculously, heroically all through the night to save the life of a precious baby boy who was born very prematurely. Thirty years later, Dr. Shannon was trapped in a burning SUV following a collision with a semi-tractor trailer. He was rescued from that burning vehicle by Chris Trokey, a paramedic with the Orange County Fire Department, who you may have already guessed by now, was the premature baby boy that Dr. Shannon had saved 30 years earlier. His heroic act of service and benevolence came back around again. It blessed him. It benefited him. And friend, in a much more powerful and glorious way, anything you do for the Lord, you haven't seen the last of it. It's coming up again. In my life, I've been blessed, and with some of those blessings, I've wasted some money before. I've wasted money on stuff that didn't last to the end of the day. I've wasted money on some stuff that I kept for a while, but eventually we sent it, put it in a box, and sent it off to Goodwill, or sometimes just put it in the trash because it wasn't worth anything at all. I've never spent a dime serving the Lord that was wasted and that I will not see again. And Paul said, if you understand the resurrection of the Savior and the reward for our service, you'll have the right attitude about giving. But there's one more thing that will impact the attitude. We've got to understand the reason for our sacrifice. In chapter 16, verse 1, Paul says, Now, concerning the collection for the saints, he says, I'm going to tell you the same thing I've told all the other churches. And according to verses 3 and 4, it's obvious that he's not talking about the regular budget giving of the church. He's talking about a special offering for the saints at Jerusalem. You see, in that day, if you remember from our study of the book of Hebrews, the saints in and around Jerusalem were under intense persecution. They were losing their jobs, they were losing their homes, they were losing their livelihood, and there was a great benevolent need. And so Paul, as part of his missionary journey, was telling all the newfound brothers and sisters in Christ that we should pull our resources together and send a special love offering back to the mother church at Jerusalem and help out our brothers and sisters in Christ who have a need. For that reason, this passage is more about a special offering than it is about what we would call our regular tithes and offerings. And that's really the season that our church is in right now challenging ourselves in prayer to give a special offering above and beyond our regular gifts. Paul says these instructions will help you know what to do in this extra special offering. Now, there are certain offerings in my life that my wife and I don't have to pray about. I don't mean to sound unspiritual, but when it comes to our weekly tithes and offerings, We don't have to pray about that every week. We pray about that once a year. 
when we figure what God would have us to give in that upcoming 12 months. And after that, we just divide it by monthly giving, divide it by weekly giving, and then that's how much we give. It's not that we don't pray about it. We just don't have to pray about it every week because it's something that is settled in our heart. I don't have to pray about giving tithes and offerings any more than I have to pray as to whether I should tell the truth or keep my marriage vow or not kill somebody. Well, raising four kids, I've had to pray about that murder thing a time or two. But there are certain things that we ought not have to constantly pray about. Our regular tithes and offerings for a mature believer ought to be a settled matter. But this offering in 1 Corinthians 16 and the offering we're talking about for next gen now is a special above and beyond offering. Last week, we approved what is basically a $2 million project for a temporary children's building, and that's just phase one of at least a two-phase building initiative for our church. And we are going to need everyone who calls Emmanuel their church home to pray about what God would have you to sacrifice for this great effort. And personally, I don't know of a better mission than investing in reaching boys and girls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't know of a better reason than the fact that I've been saved, I've been promised a bodily resurrection, a home in heaven, and a reward for everything I'll ever do in this life for Jesus. And if you've got that attitude, you don't mind giving and you don't mind preaching about giving. God has a plan for the offering. It involves a spiritual attitude. Secondly, it involves a systematic approach. Now, I've already hinted at this, but faithful giving is not haphazard. It's not casual. It's not an afterthought. I I, I don't boast in this, but I do want to be an example for you. If you were to look at the contribution record that, that Andrea and I and our family have every year for our church, It's the same amount all the way down the right-hand column of that sheet that you get to fill out your taxes. Occasionally, there's a love offering, some special gift that was given, but our regular gifts, it's the same amount over and over and over again. And I want to ask you, why would it not be that way for the people of God? You know how much your mortgage is. You've got a plan to pay it. I hope you do, or you shouldn't have taken it out. If you've got a car or a truck payment, you know how much that's going to be. Far too many of God's people plan and strategize for every area of their finances except Christian giving. But the Bible's plan for the offering, God's plan, is a systematic approach. Our church leadership is asking you to have a plan for Next Gen Now, to pray about that plan and then to share that plan with your church's leadership. In fact, today I'm announcing that Pledge Sunday for this initiative is going to be a little over a month away on Sunday, December the 10th. And on that day, you will have some pledge cards that are provided for you. No one will see it except those who already count the offering and keep the books anyway, which, by the way, does not include the pastor. We have two of our four children out of our house and two still at home. There are only four people in this church that I know what they give, and that's me and my wife and our two kids at home. I don't check other people's giving. The reason I don't is I learned a long time ago, you you can't even tell if somebody's faithful in their giving if all you know is how much they gave. You don't know how much they could have given. And you don't know how much they sacrificed to give what they gave. But on Sunday, December the 10th, we're asking you between now and then, to pray about what God would have you to give to the Next Gen Now offering during the year 2024. Figure what that would be on a monthly basis and come on the 10th of December bringing your pledge and a gift that would represent that month's of giving. Why should I sign a pledge card? I would ask you why not. If you've really sat down and prayerfully determined what God would have you and your family to give, it would be a great benefit and blessing to your church leadership be able to put all of that together and see what could be expected to come in for this initiative. 
But I see in this passage of Scripture clear indication of a systematic approach that first of all involves Sunday giving. Sunday giving. Look in the text, verse 2. On the first day of the week. Now in the Old Testament, they worshiped on the Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week. But Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. And following his resurrection, the early church gathered for worship on the first day to celebrate the resurrection. Paul says, in essence, whenever you come to church, bring that offering. That tells me a couple of things. First, that giving commenced their week. They started their week with giving. Now, I start my week and I start my day with a cup of coffee. Preferably two cups of coffee. And uh, you really don't want to talk to me too much before that cup of coffee. I'm a little bit, well, grumpy in the morning before that cup of coffee. What would the Lord's work be like if God's people were a little bit grumpy and out of sorts? If they didn't get to give in the offering. I mean, you go to work on Monday just a little bit irritable. Somebody say, what's the matter with you? You say, well, our, the baby was sick and I had to stay home with the baby and didn't get to give in the offering. And I'm either going to have to go online or put something in the mail or go by the church office because I'm going to be grumpy all week if I don't commence my week with giving. Giving commenced their week. Giving also characterized their worship. Part of their worship was the receiving of these special gifts. And by the way, in the aftermath of COVID, I personally believe that one of the things that we lost with failing to pass the offering plate is to formally, corporately have a time of giving where together, all at the same time, we bring our gifts to the Lord. And we're going to be very intentional about trying to reintroduce that into the body life here at Emmanuel because the Bible teaches Sunday giving on the first day of the week. Secondly, this systematic approach involves shared giving. The, the first phrase tells us when. The second phrase tells us who. And I need you to talk back to me, yes or no, if this is what your Bible says. On the first day of the week, let the deacons lay something aside. On the first day of the week, let the pastor and the staff. How about this one? On the first day of the week, let the rich people in the church. By the way, I learned a long time ago you can't tell just by looking who's got money and who don't. That's bad grammar, but it's really good economics. People you think have a bunch of stuff, the bank may have all of it. And people that you think maybe don't have much, that old farmer may have enough money to burn a wet mattress. You just never know. But here's the good news. We don't have to know. Because the Bible just says, each one of you. Those that would be rich, those that might be poor. I think about that little widow who went to the temple treasury and gave her last two little copper coins. And Jesus said, she gave more than all the rich people put together. Not in dollar amount, but how many of you know, Jesus doesn't count the offering with a calculator. He counts it by looking at the heart. And here the Apostle Paul says, I want each one of you to give. Now we live in a day where a lot of people practice surrogate Christianity. You think you've participated in the Christian life if you watch somebody else do it. I mean, you, you stood there silently while everybody else clapped and sang and you think, boy, didn't we sing today? What, you got a mouse in your pocket? Who are you talking about? We. Or many people give in the special offering. You don't give in it. And then when the, when the, when the debt is 
paid off, you say, boy, hallelujah, what God did at our church. Reminds me a little bit of some of the crowd shots I saw at college football games yesterday. Some old guy sitting in the stands, beer in one hand and evidence of a whole lot of other beer out in front of him. Been a long time since he ran 50 yards anywhere. I mean, if he ever runs 50 yards, shoot the bear that's chasing him. You know what I'm talking about? And yet when his team scores, he's over there, we did it, we number one, boy, we did it today. We. And you know, there are a lot of people who have that attitude in the church. And the Apostle Paul says, I don't want you to be one of those non-participants. But on the first day of the week, let each one of you take part in this special offering. I'm going to have my children take part in this offering. They've got birthday money. They got little side job money. And when, when the final tally is given on this project, 30 years from now or more, when the next pastor's putting historic photos on the screen like I did last week, I want my youngest child to be able to say, I was a part of that. It may not have been a quarter. It may not have been but a dollar. But I want to be a part of that. It was Pastor Johnny Hunt that I first heard make the statement that you don't have to be rich to be generous. You just have to be generous to be generous. This past Tuesday night at the end of our fall festival, my goal Tuesday night was to shake every hand that was wearing a yellow volunteer shirt, and I sure hope I got to each of you. And I wanted to greet and hug every one of our children that were here. And after nearly everybody was gone, right out here beside our office building, I came up and I greeted one of our young girls, still in elementary school, and she unzipped a tiny little pocketbook. You know those kind of pocketbooks that little girls will have? And she unzipped that pocketbook and reached in and pulled out a tiny little handful of candy. A couple of dumb, dumb suckers, some flavored taffy, and she said, Pastor Mike, I'm so glad I got to see you tonight. With it being Pastor Appreciation Month, I've been saving this to give to you. Part of me wanted to say, no, honey, you, you keep that. You'll enjoy that candy. But how many of you know I would not have denied her the blessing of giving me that little handful of candy? You see, you don't have to have a lot to be generous. Can I say it like this? You don't have to give much. You just got to be willing to give everything. To say, all to Jesus I surrender. And Jesus knows that you have needs. So when you give it all to Him, guess what? He's he going to give you some to pay your light bill. <laughs> he knows you have needs. But the Bible teaches us here that every single person should be involved. From the wealthy to the welfare recipient, the charter member and the new member, the young and the old. Let each one of you. There's Sunday giving and shared giving, and then there's what I will call storehouse giving. Now, the storehouse was a room at the temple in the Old Testament. It was the place that that goods were stored when the people came to worship. And I believe Paul makes a reference to storehouse giving in this text. Verse 2, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up. One translation says, lay by him in store. That is, save it up, and on the first day of the week, bring it to the local church. Now, verse 3 indicates clearly the offering is going to be at the church and it's going to be accountable under the accountability of leaders at the church. This text says whoever you appoint as a congregation to oversee the distribution of the offering, that's who's going to do it. You know, at the local church, there's accountability and oversight that doesn't always exist with these big-name preachers on television and on YouTube. Here at our church, we have a counting committee, a stewardship committee. We've got purchase order process. We've got regular policies and review. And just to be frank, 
If your pastor started driving a $250,000 sports car and living in a million dollar house out on the lake, it wouldn't be long in Blackshear before you'd know about it. Storehouse giving. Every year, the Emmanuel Baptist Church gives away hundreds of thousands of dollars to reach people literally to the ends of the earth. And because of that, I like to regularly remind you, the light that shines the farthest shines brightest at its source. And if this church is to be continually used to touch the nations of the world with the gospel, we must be used to build a firm foundation here at 217 Carter Avenue. A spiritual attitude, a systematic approach. But God's plan for giving, His plan for the offering, involves a third thing, and I'm so excited about this. It involves a sufficient amount. A sufficient amount. Look at what verse 2 says. Let him store up as he may prosper, that there be no collection when I come. You may well remember that after Paul left the city of Corinth, he went to nearby Ephesus. And at the end of chapter 16, he tells the Corinthians, I want to come see you, but I can't come right now. A wide door of opportunity for service has opened for me in Ephesus. I've got to wait until after Pentecost. But Paul is planning to come back and make a visit to the church at Corinth. And this is what he means in verse 2. He says, when I come back for homecoming, I don't want to have to preach on the offering. When I come back for Pastor Appreciation Day, for Founding Pastor Honor Day, I don't want to have to bend your ear or twist your arm. I really don't even want to have to preach about the offering. If you'll just simply do what what God has laid on your heart to do. We won't have to have a special offering when I come. The need will be met and the amount will be sufficient. Now in many churches, they utilize high pressure systems for capital fundraising. Some of you have been in churches that have done this. In a previous time, we did this in our own church. You know where you have capital fundraising teams that go out and sit in the living room across the coffee table from you, and they want you to hand them the pledge card so they can see how much money you gave, and we can put it all together. And while there's nothing inherently sinful with that, not at all, that's really not what I feel led to ask us as a church to do. What I want to do is to challenge you. Ask God, how much have you been blessed? How much would He have you to give? And then at the appointed time and in the appointed way, just do what God told you to do. And you have a promise from God's Word, it will be enough. In fact, on the authority of that same Word, if it's not enough, it's only because somebody or a whole bunch of somebodies did not do what God laid on their heart to do. So what I want to do is preach and you pray and then give whatever God tells you to give. Now, it will be a sufficient amount if we give three ways. Number one, proportional giving. For the text says that he should give as he may prosper. The NIV, which is my least favorite major Bible translation, says that he should give in keeping with his income. The original phrase literally means that he should give as he's been blessed on the road. Give as he's been blessed. This is why I've used the word proportional instead of the word percentage. Because when you give based on percentage, that's not necessarily giving as you've been prospered. For example, you take a single mother who makes $30,000 a year, she tithes and lives on $27,000, for her to give an extra $100 a month, she didn't have any idea where that could come from. A millionaire who tithes, and lives on the other 900,000, I think we could all agree another $100 a month 
We'll use it, but it's really not much of a sacrifice. That's not really proportional giving. The bottom line is, I believe that those of us who have been blessed more should give more. And that's not my opinion. That's my interpretation of the text. How much should we give? That's always everybody's question. Give as you have been prospered. I want to share a couple of numbers with you. But before we do, I want you to take a deep breath on three. One, two, three. And now you can breathe out. Okay? Don't be troubled by these numbers. Listen to the whole thing. For us to move in this new building debt-free in about a year, we really need a one-year 50% increase in giving. That's a person who normally gives $100 ever, whenever that would give $150. A person who gives $500 to give $750. And I recognize, and I want you to know God recognizes, that not every person in this room can do that. Not everybody could take what they've normally been giving and say, I'm just going to add another 50% on top of that, I will say more could do that than would normally do it if we would have a heart of sacrifice. But I do recognize not everybody could do that, but that's about what the average needs to be. So preacher, how will I know where I fit on the scale of average? Well, in 2021, which is the last year for statistics to be available, average household giving in Pierce County, and it's about the same in all the connected counties as well, Average household income, just under $51,000 a year. Now, that's mama working. That's daddy working. If little Johnny and little Susie have a job flipping hamburgers or babysitting, that's everything that comes into the household, just short of $51,000. That's average. Well, you know what your income is. Where do you fit on the scale of average? I'm not saying that's God's answer to you. I'm saying that's a mathematical starting point to get an idea of where I fit on the scale of average. John Wesley, the great Methodist preacher, began his ministry making 30 pounds a month. 30 pounds, of course, was English currency. He lived on 27 and gave three a tithe to the ministry. His income increased to 60 pounds. He lived on 28 and gave 32 to the ministry. His income increased to 90 pounds. He lived on 28 and gave 62 to the ministry. His income increased to 120 pounds. He continued to live on 28 and gave 92 to the ministry. By retirement, his income was 1,400 pounds. He already knew he could live on 27, but he splurged and lived on 30 pounds and gave 1,370 to the ministry, or 98%. Preacher, are you suggesting I should live on 2% and give 98% only if you've got enough money to do that and if that's what God tells you to do? Proportional giving. Well, how am I going to know that, preacher? We'll write down a second word. Not just proportional giving, but prayerful giving. I've already mentioned to you there's some things like tithes and offerings that I don't have to regularly pray about. But this is something that I believe God would have us to approach Him in prayer and ask God to reveal to us, how have I been prospered and what would you have me to give? Now, frankly, it could very well be that this emphasis today in the next two weeks could be used by God to address a more general area of disobedience in your life when it comes to giving. It could be that you're already not doing what God has commanded and enabled you to do. Don't be upset about it. Thank God for it. And just do whatever the Lord has laid on your heart. But I want to issue a simple, specific challenge. Ask the Lord what He would have your extra gift to be in 2024. Having gotten the mind of God, be ready to make that pledge and give that monthly gift on Sunday, December the 10th. Before I close, I'll give you this humble pastoral suggestion. The first number that comes to your mind is probably not the right number. Because if you're like me, and I suspect you're a lot like me, 
The first number that comes to our mind tends to be from the flesh and not from the Lord. It tends to be a comfortable, convenient number and not a proportional, prayerful number. Then finally, we'll see if we give with this approach, it will bring about plentiful giving so that no collections be made when I come. I tell you on the authority of the Word of God, if we'll just get alone with God, follow His direction, obey His voice, it will be enough. The story is told of a wealthy Christian businessman who through his life gave millions and millions of dollars to a Christian orphanage. Near the end of his life, there was a downturn in that sector of the economy, and the man ended up losing it all. One of his friends asked him, having lost all your money, do you now regret giving those millions away to the Christian orphanage? And he said, not at all. Because actually, the money I gave to the Lord is the only money that I still have left. God's plan for the offering is very simple. Let's pray and do what the Lord has laid on our hearts to do. And as your pastor, I couldn't be more excited for the opportunity that I have and to know that you're going to join me in following the leadership of the Lord. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, where Pastor Mike Stone is committed to walking you verse by verse through the books of the Bible. You can contact us through our church website at ebchurch.net or visit pastormikestone.com. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Emanuel Pulpit.